Good evening, everyone. I declare the meeting open at one minute past six. On behalf of the City of Vincent, I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the Wadjuk people of the Noongar Nation, and we pay our respects to Elders, past, present and emerging. I'd just like to let members of the public gallery know that at the City of Vincent we do live web stream our council meetings, but we do respect your privacy so that um, when you come to the microphone and you give your name and address, I just want to assure you that this part of the meeting will not be broadcast and that we commit broadcast after the conclusion of public question time. Um, just in terms of apologies and members on approved leave of absence, just want to check. I'm not sure whether we've had an um, apology from Councillor Harley. No? OK. I will assume that Councillor Harley is running late. And also just to note that our CEO, Len Kosova, is away due to personal reasons and that sitting in the CEO's chair tonight we have Mick Quirk, our Director of Community Engagement. It's now public question time, so this is your opportunity to approach the microphone and um, speak on any item on the agenda. Um, we do ask that you give your name, your address and state the item that you're speaking to. And we also do ask that you speak to three minutes. Um, we do time, public question time, so that we're fair to everyone and that we keep to an efficient um, meeting time. If at the end of three minutes you haven't concluded your statement, you are free to hand that over to someone that has come to the meeting with you or to email councillors during the week um, or again attend um, council meeting next Tuesday. So there's no order, it's just whoever wishes to come up first, so I invite the first speaker to come forward, please. Thank you. We've now commenced live streaming of the council briefing. So for anyone who's tuned in, just to let you know that we have just concluded public question time and we're about to start um, questions um, on uh, reports on the agenda this evening. In terms of the order that we might take questions, because we have got a number of people that are here today, um, actually they've all asked questions in relation to 5.1, which is the first report, so that's handy. Um, and then following on from that, um, we can move to questions in relation to Galway Street, which is item 6.3. So we'll do with, deal with those two matters first. and. We've also had a question in relation to 5.2, so we'll deal with those three items first and just also confirm that Councillor Harley will be attending but is, has notified that she's late, so she'll be here shortly. In relation to item 5.1, number 143 Edward Street, Perth, change of use from showroom and office to drop-in centre and office. Uh, councillors, do you have any questions in relation to this item? Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you, Madam Mayor, um, and I'm happy for this to be taken on notice. Just the Director of uh, Development Services, um, and perhaps we should also note that. Oh, I will note also that, uh, being a briefing session, our role is to ask questions and not to make any commentary. Um, so these are, these are purely questions. Um, just in terms of the management plan, it, from my reading and understanding and understanding of it, it deals uh, almost solely with the operation of the facility itself. Um, and obviously talks about the numbers, uh, etc. But it doesn't make any mention of uh, what happens to people who are potentially turned away from the facility because of numbers issues. It deals with how they will be treated on the facility, and obviously CCTV and otherwise. But there's, uh, I'd be interested to know what um, what the current operation is on Palmerston Street, and what is the. Um, I note in the management plan it talks also about um, monitoring one hour after closure in terms of making sure people aren't on site. Um, but what happens to people who aren't able to attend the facility for one reason or another, uh, whether it be due to numbers or other issues, if they're not allowed, what responsibility and what does the management plan state um, or what expectations can the community and the council place upon management to, uh, to deal with people who aren't actually uh, um, entitled to access to the facility? Um, the other question that I had for you relates to the responses. So, is it possible in the briefing notes that we are able to receive, um, and happy to have uh, names and addresses uh, redacted, but to actually receive a copy of the submissions? Because the summary of the submissions, considering there were 86 of them, seems to be rather brief. Um, so I'd be interested to see uh, what the content of the actual submissions and the, re the response to them uh, in some instances seem to be relatively general. 
um, and also further in relation to the, um, the last question that we got from the gentleman in the gallery, um, which I assume will be answered uh, um, uh, as, as part of the briefing notes or perhaps uh, formally answered prior to next week's meeting, um, if we can get some uh, clarity around the satisfaction of the uh, clauses in the town planning scheme uh, relating to, um, to amenity in particular in terms of the approval of unlisted use. If you've got any of those answers now, that would be great, but otherwise happy to have them taken on notice. Um, through you, Mayor Cole. In relation to the first question, um, I think the applicant, I think the, the submitters made it clear in the submissions that there is, as did um, one of the speakers uh, earlier, that there is already a, a homelessness issue in the area. There are, are a number of homeless people that frequent the area at the moment. Um, the applicant um, is certainly not going to be responsible for homelessness in the area as a result of, of their proposal um, and clients that they turn away either because they um, don't fall within the scope of the services provided or because um, they've breached uh, the requirements of the management plan. Um, will not be the responsibility of the applicant and they're not covered in the management plan. So as is the current situation, um, homelessness is an issue that we all are part of uh, addressing and dealing with um, and the applicant's um, certainly not going to be responsible for all homelessness in the area as a result of this proposal. Um, the second question was in relation to the submissions. We certainly can provide a, a full um, copy of all those submissions for elected members, for the council members. Um, and in relation to the last question around the objectives, under the legal and policy section in the report, uh, the relevant, relevant objectives are included, um, but we can, I can take that on notice and review it again to make sure that there's nothing um, missing. Um, the simple fact is uh, there are no specific objectives in the scheme for any of the zones under TPS1. So um, TPS1 specifically says for an unlisted use, um, it must be assessed against the objectives for that zone. There are no objectives for any of the city's zones. So um, we have used the general objectives under the scheme um, and we've also used the objectives under TPS2 for the residential commercial zone, noting that TPS2 is not yet um, gazetted and in force. It's a seriously entertained proposal, but um, in essence, there are no objectives for the for the zone currently. So uh, that makes it um, more general and, and quite difficult. So we've we've laid out all of that, um, all of the relevant objectives that we think should be taken into consideration in the legal and policy section of the report. Councillor Loden. Thank you, Chair. Just to raise um, the questions that were raised from the gallery there, so um, I'll fire them off to you and see how you go, uh, Director of Development Services. Um, so one of the issues the issues raised was um, the issue of homelessness and people sleeping on the street, um, the issue of a lack of a public toilet in that area and um, public defecation, and the issue the impacts to business owners from the homeless people in that general vicinity. Um, the consideration that it's the report says that it's not a vibrant that, that it is a vibrant area, but it, that that it, they they feel it is not a vibrant area. Um, the questions raised around it be, there being brothels close by, specifically referring to uh, section 20, 21, 22 of the Prostitution Act, and if, uh, how that impacts on the proposal, um, and uh, the the potential prohibition of um, uh, sites where children or pe young people access being within 200 metres of um, or they're basically creating an exclusion zone around brothels. And then the other three were around an increase in antisocial behaviour as a result of this, the impact on development and revitalisation of the area and also whether or not the proposal meets the parking requirements. Um, through you, Mayor Cole, I will try and cover all of that. Um, just in relation to the parking, um, the application has been assessed against the institutional building parking standards as well as the recreation centre parking standards and complies with both of those and so hasn't been 
Um, that hasn't been included in the report because it's deemed to comply um, in, in regard to those two, in, in regard to the policy that we have. Um, in relation to the Prostitution Act 2000, um, the City has no jurisdiction over that Act and no ability to enforce that Act. That is the, that is the responsibility of the WA Police. Um, the City understands that there are um, two brothels operating in the area. Um, in other states of Australia, um, planning legislation does apply to um, brothels and prostitution in where there's a land use proposed. Um, in WA, uh, the legislation does not allow the city to have any, um, or for, the, for the, the city to approve or apply any conditions to illegal land uses and illegal development. So prostitution is illegal in Western Australia and so um, the city has no jurisdiction to uh, put restrictions over prostitution or around prostitution. Um, has no ability to put restrictions around children's activities in and around existing brothels. Um, it's completely outside of the, the local government's jurisdiction and is the responsibility of the WA Police. Um, as the community may be aware, the WA Police um, does, is aware of, this, of these two brothels um, and does manage their activities. Um, and if there are any queries around that, they need to be um, provided to Doria Police because the city has um, no involvement or jurisdiction in that, in that area. Uh, in relation to children um, accessing this service, um, as was mentioned again um, in some of the submissions and, and earlier this evening, um, there already is a large number of homeless people in the area. Um, in the applicant's response to the submission into the submissions that were, were made around that issue, um, the, the homeless people that access these services are exposed already to um, these situations and to these brothels and to um, exploitation on the street. These services are here to support them through that approach, th through those issues, um, and it's not considered by the city that this service will lead to further exploitation of these um, young people. Rather, it will lead to um, these young people being empowered and provided with the ability and the, the services they need um, to reduce the level of exploitation they have. So um, that's, that's the assessment that we've made on, on that issue. Um, similarly, in relation to um, the antisocial behaviour that um, that some of the submitters were concerned about. Um, again, that is an issue that already exists. Homelessness is already an issue um, in the area and um, increasing the level of services that we provide so that we can reduce that homelessness will, um, in the city's assessment of it, uh, reduce the level of antisocial behaviour. The applicant has gone a long way through the management plan um, to ensure that all of the people accessing their service are made aware of the requirements for them to access that service, um, are made aware of the rules around the time, the times that the service is open, um, the fact that they can't sleep out the front of the service, um, they can't loiter in front of the service, and they will be actively managing that, both while the service is in operation as well as after the service is closed and before the service opens in the morning so they can ensure that it hasn't been happening. Um, so we consider that the antisocial behaviour issues um, will not be increased by this proposal, um, given that it's going to this service actually supports homeless people and reduces the level of homelessness. Um, we think that it will actually reduce antisocial behaviour across the area where it, where it already exists. Um, and similarly, in relation to um, the viability and the rejuvenation of this area, services like this are considered to support that. This proposal, given the detailed management measures proposed, is considered to be compatible with the redevelopment um, of the area. Um, I think it's, it's worthy noting um, other similar proposals that have provided support to young people in Vincent, such as FOIA Oxford, uh, where there was a significant concern at the time around antisocial behaviour and the management of, of um, 
the users of those facilities has shown that it not only the, the antisocial behaviour that was a concern of submitters at the time has not only, not only been managed well by the development but has actually led to vibrancy and increased opportunities for redevelopment um, in that area. So again, um, not that I can demonstrate any of this, just like I can't demonstrate uh, categorically that the development will increase antisocial behaviour or decrease it, um, but it's certainly not considered well, it's considered that there is an opportunity here to actually increase the vibrancy of the area through the support of the people that are already in that area. Thank you, Director. Councillor Loden again. And uh, just a further follow-up question. With the management plan being one of the major ways of, uh, I guess, um, managing this development, uh, what, what powers does the City of Vincent have if um, the... Uh, owner does not comply with the management plan and what steps can local businesses or residents, what, what can they do if they don't believe that the development is complying with the management plan? Uh, through you Mayor Cole, um, if landowners or, or residents in the area are concerned with the, um, the operator not complying with the management plan, um, they can contact the city, um, put that concern in writing and all concerns um, will be investigated by the city's compliance team. Um, we have a, a compliance team, planning compliance team, that, that is there um, that undertakes those investigations every day. Um, if the operator is found not to be complying with the management plan, um, they will be given an opportunity to rectify that and where they don't rectify um, the, uh, the lack of compliance with the management plan, um, the city will then take um, action against the operator. Um, the penalties under the Planning and Development Act are very substantial for an individual. Um, they're up to $200,000 ultimately, um, and for a corporation up to $1 million. So the, the penalties are very substantial and um, generally uh, planning compliance as a result is, is successfully managed by the city. We don't have any major um, issues with, with that given the, the extent of the penalties. Thank you, Director. Councillor Gondoshevsky. Thank you, Mayor. Um, through you to the Director of Development Services. Um, the table that sets out the deemed to comply assessment um, uh, references the use of reflective glazing in the ground floor design, but um, in the main body of the report it um, talks more about the fencing design. So I was just wondering if you could provide some more information on that. Yes, through the Mayor, that, that shouldn't be in there. Sorry, that's an error, it should be taken out. The, um, the existing building has reflective glazing, but the proposal does not um, propose new reflective glazing. They are proposing for the glazing to remain as it is. Um, so the it, there's not a new proposal for existing, for reflective glazing. So it's not a variation as such. Councillors, Councillor Hallett. Thanks to the Mayor. I guess to either the Director of Development Services or Community Engagement. Um, just wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on uh, what information or data we've got of um, the, any homelessness issue in that area in terms of the age of um, the folks um, engaged in some of that antisocial behaviour um, and what some of the other initiatives, in summary, um, that Vincent's engaged in in terms of addressing homelessness in the area. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, um, I will take uh, demographic or, or numbers information on notice. Uh, the city doesn't have that data, but we can seek to obtain it um, from some of the service delivery agencies. Uh, the city, uh, over the last 12 to 18 months in particular, has been implementing a, a range of initiatives uh, to assist in addressing the prevalence of homelessness. Uh, this has included the um, allocation of uh, grants, um, and in particular two quite significant grants um, last year to help with the delivery of um, emergency accommodation for, for at-risk homelessness. Um, as well as uh, some delivery of uh, employment and, and laundry services. Uh, the city has uh, been working very closely with organisations such as Manor Inc and Noongar Outreach Services as well to support either directly or indirectly the, the delivery of on-the-ground services. 
Councillor Hallett, any, any further? Councillor Gondoshevsky. Sorry, one more from me. Um, this was just in relation to the comments provided by the City of Perth in relation to the operation of this service. Obviously, it's an existing service that's operated for many years um, and from Northbridge. So is it possible for um, any that information to be provided to councillors in terms of... Um, I note the City of Perth provided comments that um, uh, in, in relation to um, complaints to council and how these had been managed. Through the Mayor, I'm not sure that the City of Perth provided any detail, but we certainly can um, provide whatever, whatever they have given us. Um, and if they haven't given us any detail, we can request that and see if we can get that to you before Tuesday. Thank you for raising that question, um, Councillor Gondoshevsky. I also was going to request whether we could get a little bit more detail from the City of Perth about the number of complaints, the nature of complaints and the period of time over which the complaints have been made. Given that they've been operating in the area for 18 years. Um, while I'm speaking, I also just wanted to ask a question through the to the Director of um, Development Services, just in relation to lighting of the premises. I'm just wondering whether there will be 24-hour lighting at the premises. Um, through the mayor, I'll take that on notice and. Um investigate that and speak to the applicant as well to understand what they're proposing in relation to lighting. Are there any further questions in relation to this item? Okay, we'll move on to item 5.2, which is 53 to 65 Wasley Street and 90 Forest Street, North Perth, which is an amendment to existing approvals for independent living units and a nursing home. Um, also, just, just um, before we do start taking questions, I just wanted to mention that I didn't raise declarations of interest. We haven't received any, but I probably should have just mentioned that none were received, in fact, but now we have. So that was timely. <laughs> yes, I'll just hand over to the um, Director of uh, Community Engagement to read out the declarations of interest. Uh, thank you, Mayor Cole. I have received uh, two disclosures of interest affecting financial financial and proximity. Uh, they are received from Councillor Toppelberg. Um, the first one is in relation to item 6.2, um, proposed parking restrictions in Broom Street. Uh, Councillor Toppelberg has disclosed an interest on, based on the fact that he has an association with the applicant, that association being his family owns a property and he resi and reside within the area where the restrictions are proposed. Uh, the nature of interest is a proximity interest. The second disclosure of interest in affecting financial and proximity, again from Councillor Toppelberg, is in relation to item 6.2. Um, Excuse me, that, that is, that's Councillor Murphy, is it? Sorry, yes. Um, must have very similar handwriting. Yes, it is a very similar handwriting. I, I do apologise. The, the, in, in fact, the, the fact that it was the same item um, did give it away after I started talking. Um, so the, the second disclosure, disclosure of interest affecting financial and proximity is from Councillor Murphy. It is again in relation to item 6.2, the proposed parking restrictions on Broom Street. Councillor Murphy has disclosed uh, an association with the applicant that is or the person seeking a decision, the association being that Councillor Murphy part owns a house on Broome Street, and on that basis he's declared a proximity interest. Can I just clarify from both of you whether you will be seeking to participate or whether you're happy to um, remove yourself um, when that item is discussed? Okay, they'll both be out of, out of the chamber when they're discussed. Thank you. Okay, so we were moving on to item 5.2, which was the um, amendment to the existing approval for the independent living units and nursing home on Wasley and Forest. Are there any questions? Councillor Gondoshevsky was first. Uh, just if we could um, potentially get the wording of the amended amendment, that would be lovely. Thank you. Uh, through the Mayor, yes, we can provide that once we've um, gone through it in detail and gone, uh, we'll also contact uh, the applicant and make sure that everyone's comfortable with what's being proposed. But in principle, um, you know, as was outlined by um, Ms Morridge earlier, the, the, the principle of this condition is to ensure that buildings don't occur across boundaries for a number of reasons. 
um, and the proposed revised condition that uh, the applicant has put to us uh, yesterday evening um, would certainly achieve that outcome. Uh, we just need to ensure that the wording of it um, is satisfactory and then we'll circulate that to um, council members as part of the briefing pack and we'll update the council report. But it is quite straightforward. So, Can I just clarify, Director, um, if you're satisfied that that amendment or is, is um, in the interest of the city and OK, will that just form part of the new recommended motion? Yes, through the Mayor, that's correct. Thank you. Any further questions? There were some before. It was all on the same issue, all the same question. Any further? OK, we'll move on to item 6.3, which was raised in the public gallery, which is proposed parking restrictions in Galway Street, leadable between Scott Shakespeare and Loftus Streets. Any questions in relation to Councillor Gondoshevsky? Um, <coughs> yes, so just in relation to um, the some of the statements made by um, Robert in the gallery um, that um, it took, uh, Robert spoke about that if um, the resident parking zones or that are currently demarcated in Galway Street um, if they are parked out then um, other than passenger vehicles no ve there was not there's not room for other vehicles to navigate the street um, I, uh, so I'm just clar want to clarify in terms of what um, width or what uh, I guess access um, exists currently on the street um, in relation to parking, um, and um, get confirmation in relation to I guess the access for garbage trucks and um, rubbish trucks and um, emergency vehicles, um, c just to confirm that that is possible within the existing parking arrangement. So through you to the um, acting director of technical services. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole. Um, Galway Street at that end, or the Loftus Street end, six metres wide road pavement. Uh, typical parking lane is 2.1. So assuming you had a car parked on either side of the road, that leaves 3.8 down the centre. 3.8 uh, can accommodate the garbage truck and larger vehicles. It's, it's not ideal, obviously, because it is, uh, creates this narrow uh, streetscape as such. But a vehicle can get down there. Essentially what it means is that there's opportunities where cars are parked uh, not directly opposite each other but uh, offset. A vehicle can go up the street, pull over to the left, allow someone else to pass and vice versa going in either direction. It, it's not uncommon um, pavement width within the city of Vincent, the six metres. Councillors? Councillor Buckles? Just a follow-up question for you, Mayor. Um, that, that parking width would be on change from the present parking situation, though, with or without the 2P. Two, two it's just so cars can still park on both sides of the street, can they? And it would, doesn't that, so what we're proposing doesn't actually change the effective width. Uh, through you, uh, Chair. Um, no, nothing. What's marked there now is uh, essentially no stopping at crossovers and inappropriate places to park. So that doesn't change. Councillor Hallett. Uh, through you, Mayor, to the um, director of, Acting Director of Technical Services. Um, with the original consultation around the 2P parking restrictions, and obviously that's in a 8 to 5.30 period, weekdays and similar to what we've done elsewhere in the city, um, is there scope to extend that to other times? Um, noting that from the public gallery, the comment around it's more of a 24-hour scenario, and I guess what are the considerations around that or if not doing it? Uh, through the chair, I mean, certainly there are examples of we've got 8 to 8 p.m., 8 to 6 p.m., all dependent on uh, the situation in a particular locality. But given this is the residential nature of the street and there's no actual activity generator as such there now, there's no commercial, there's no school immediately adjacent to that section of the street, I could see no reason why it should vary to what's been applied in the surrounding streets, which is 8 to 8, 5.30 p.m. Monday to Friday. Councillor Harley. My question is in regards to the flow-on effect and what, what we, because what we often see is we place a restriction on one street and not long after we find that further restrictions are needed on adjacent streets. So my question to the director is in putting the 2P parking restrictions here, 
do do you know what the overall impact may be or flow on effect um, there's with other restrictions that are already um, in place and um, not too far away uh, we've got an approval for a church where there'll be um, parking needed and in fact part of that approval was based on there being a lot of parking in that area um, without restrictions so um, you may not have that answer tonight but that for me will be um, a factor in my decision next week. Uh, through the Chair I can obviously look at that more closely and provide a more detailed response. Um, the report talks to the occupancy of 58%, which is, I believe is the average occupancy. Do you know what the, do we have data on what the peak occupancy was? I'd have to take that on notice, but from recollection, um, it would have been in the high 60s and there was periods when it was in the low 40s and less. So that was the averaged out over uh, five different surveys. And just a follow-up question, in, in terms of times that that was done, was that just done between um, 8 th 8.30 and 5.30, or were there any uh, sample points in the time after 5.30? No, through the chair, no, they were done randomly during standard business hours, 8 to 5.30. Sorry, for... Sorry, a further question um, to the one I asked is can you look specifically at um, potential impact on Austin Lane and Tennyson, which you've mentioned in the report being the parallel roads, uh, which are also um, roads that people, uh, local people use um, consistently to get through from Loftus through to Oxford. So if you could focus on those two streets as well, that would be appreciated. Yeah, through the chair, I will include those two. Um, look, I just wanted to state um, that I did have a meeting with Sue Irwin and Derek Lamond, who are residents living on Galway Street on the 3rd of July, and they did raise with me the, um, the issue of where they felt the parking impacts either are being felt or would be felt with the um, development that's currently not under construction but into the future. And um, I think I would personally love to see a bit more discussion in the report about the impact of different categories of um, parking, commuter, um, probably a little further away from the TAFE for it to be student orientated. Um, we talked about leisure parking, I just love that terminology. <laughs> Obviously being those people that are going into the town centre to, um, to go and enjoy a leadable life. Um, versus apartment um, part parking and whether there... I know that there is one development in situ now on the corner but the other one is not yet developed and what potential impact there could be from that existing development and the future, future development. Um, and just in terms of um, understanding the existing parking restrictions north of the Leadable Town Centre, it would be very useful, if possible, to have a map with the existing parking restrictions marked out because from reading the report and from um, understanding the, the way in which the parking restrictions have rolled out, it seems that this is on the perimeter radiating out from the Leadable Town Centre. So if you could just have that confirmed on a map and also the existing parking restrictions, just to look at um, how that, that flows across that particular area. Um, and also, yeah, just just some a bit more information about what would be the impact of introducing restrictions into the evenings and potentially the weekend. <coughs> Thank you, Director. Councillor Toppelberg. Just while we're asking for more things, um, if it's possible, can we get some? Because obviously we've got the survey data, but if we can get set some uh, near map images, just which obviously gives a snapshot over time. It's only a short section of street. Um, that would give us an indication of what the actual issue is on the ground at varying times. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions on this item? Um, just director, just that um, Mr Player raised concerns about safety and illegal parking. I'm not sure if that's something that 
perhaps yourself or the Director of Community Engagement would like to respond to in relation to how that's dealt with by the City? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, I, I am certainly aware that Rangers have a, a regular presence um, in this particular street. Um, myself and the manager of Rangers has actually uh, attended um, a residential address to talk about some of the, the challenges and some of the impacts of, of recent um, modifications to the street. So um, I, I can certainly provide some data um, in terms of how many cautions or infringements have been issued, but I do certainly know that uh, Rangers regularly patrol the street. Thank you, Director. And just also one other thing that I find that residents are not always aware of, um, which um, I found when I met with um, Mrs Irwin and Mr Lamond, was that they were not aware that residents do have the first right to park on the verge. That might be something that would be useful to include in the report, because um, I know there's discussion about whether residents have first right to park on the road outside their house, which is um, something we're grappling with, but in terms of the actual parking on the verge, I think that's something that's not always widely known in the community. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay, we'll move on to item 6.1, proposed Safe Active Streets Project Phase 2, formerly known as a Bike Boulevard, um, Shakespeare Street, Leaderville, Mount Hawthorne, um, Progress Report 2. Any questions in relation? Yep, Councillor Buckles. And thank you, Mayor. If I could just through you ask, just regarding the the timeline that's presented, which page is it on? On page um, on page 76, just noting that, and just based upon what, what went on at the other end of Shakespeare Street, that we appear to be not doing any community consultation until the design has been completed. Um, and I'm just wondering whether there's an opportunity to do some uh, more uh, some earlier consultation with the streets it's quite a long street and there there, there are areas where I guess a lot of the, the parking parallel parking on the surrounding verges may maybe <laughs> maybe a bit of an issue I don't know if it is but I just don't want to hit March 2018 I mean November December with the construction due in March 2018 and discovering that there's significant community issues I mean the the other end was quite tricky to tricky to work through so just a uh, just a question around that, thanks. Uh, through the Chair, we're in, we actually have engaged a surveyor to do a detailed survey and then we'll do a concept plan that we can consult on. We don't intend to get down to the nth degree of detail, but I think we need something to take out to the residents to show them what we intend to do. Councillor Loden. Um, on that topic of time frame, uh, is there any risk that this will potentially clash with um, the pipes for Perth happening on Oxford Street, which is right next door? Uh, through the Chair, discussions to date would suggest no, but I will reinforce that with Water Court before we progress too much further. And then just continuing on from the, so if, if, say, for example, they were delayed um, and this did start to uh, creep into this, would we look to then delay the implementation so we're not doing two projects or one project, someone else doing one project and us doing one next door and the associated challenges of getting around? Uh, through the Chair, we'd obviously have that discussion with the Department of Transport because uh, their intention is we acquit this project by the end of the financial year, but yes, there could be scheduling issues if Water Court don't deliver on their uh, scheduled conclusion or completion of the works in Oxford Street. Uh, then on um, particularly at the bottom end of the proposal around Scott Street, it's quite a narrow street and doesn't have much of a tree canopy. The document talks about I think every 100 metres including a sort of zag in the road with the tree included in that. Is there a potential to increase the number in that area just to help um, tying in with our greening plan as well? Uh, through the Chair, certainly there is. Um, the example shown in the report, which is from the City of Bayswater, is a simplified version of what we did in the northern end of Shakespeare, so I think there is an opportunity to include additional trees. Councillors, um, look, I just wanted to ask two questions in relation to just seeking absolute clarity that the Richmond Street link is included in the $1.1 million funding, that that will be completed as part of this project. 
uh, through the chair, yes, the Richmond Street link is. The one that's yet to be confirmed is the Burke Street link, depending on the final cost of the initial part of the project through to Richmond Street. <coughs> is, it an, is it a possibility still on the table that the Burke Street link may also be funded from this um, contribution? Or I mean, it's, a, it's quite a right, decent stretch of road. Uh, through the chair, we the survey will extend to include Burke Street, so then when we do cost the substantial part of the project, if there's sufficient funds, then the Department of Transport is quite keen to do the Burke Street link. Councillor Loden, can I just ask my final question and then I'll come to you. Um, I note that um, the pinch points that were used in Bayswater have, have been used as a bit of an example of um, having a better impact on reducing traffic and I interestingly just had a resident who lives on the completed part of Shakespeare Street raised with me that the um, the pinch points were being followed by cars but as people have gotten used to it the speed is starting to be reintroduced down into the phase one of the um, safer active street um, would there be any consideration of a retrospective application of the raised curb pinch points in the phase one of the and the already completed section? Oh, through the chair, that's certainly possible, but it couldn't be funded out of this budget, which is exclusively from Scar Beach Road South. But we could certainly look at the in the 18, uh, 18 19 financial year include funds to do that if, if required. We'll be doing further follow-up traffic studies in conjunction with the DOT to find out what the outcome is in stage one, as we will be for stage two. Thank you. I'd be interested to see the data. Councillor Loden? I just wanted to clarify. So the um, Burke Street link is proposed as a safe active street, not a bike lanes either side, uh, separated bike lanes. Uh, through the Chair, there's, there's no decision being made on that as such. We haven't had that discussion with the DOT. We're going to cost the, the substantive part of the, the project first and then we'll have the discussions about what we and they envisage for the, the Burke Street link. Any, any further questions? No? Okay, we'll move on. Moving on to item 6.2, proposed parking restrictions in Broome Street, Highgate between Smith and Lord Streets. Um, councillors, are there any questions in relation to this item? Councillor Gondoshevsky. Just one confirmatory question. Um, just uh, that noting the occupancy at 40% and also noting that we don't have a full category matrix for this particular area, um, I presume that uh, just to get confirmation that the, um, the decision around no implementation, that, that sort of aligns with what we'd done in North Perth around um, less than 45% having no restriction or 3P. Is that sort of, was that part of the decision, um, sort of what has been implemented in other centres in relation to percentage occupancy? When we did the um, occupancy survey, obviously the conclusion was that taken randomly over the standard work day, there was no situation where there was the street was particularly congested and by imposing restrictions and the potential was it would displace some of that parking into these surrounding streets. Um, it's a case-by-case case, uh, study at this point in time, we, and that's why in the recommendation I'm suggesting that we look at the whole, that's the whole section holistically. Any further questions on this item? Yes, yeah, sorry, um, through you, Matt, just so a follow-on to that. So in a similar um, vein to what we've talked about with Galway Street, we, it does feel a little bit ad hoc and it would be really useful if we could have an overall view of what this looks like. I'm not sure if that can be provided by next week, just to be able to map out where we think from our past experience further restrictions are going to occur or where traffic may, parkers may be displaced to once we start putting restrictions. Uh, through the chair, I'm sure we can come up with a um, pretty basic plan that just shows existing restrictions and the streets that don't have restrictions at the current time. Yeah. Perhaps something similar to what I was requesting in relation to Leadable could be done the same for this item. Any further questions? Okay, we'll move on. Um, thanks, Tim. 
to Corporate Services, item 7.1, Financial Statements, as at 30th of June 2017. Any questions in relation to this item? Just wait for Councillor Murphy and Councillor... Yes, Councillor Tolberg does have a question. Thank you. That was dramatic. Um, question to the Director of Corporate Services. Uh, I know we're getting the operational review coming through, but what's going on with BD Park and when can we expect <coughs> some, some hard data in relation to the numbers? I'm not worried about the <coughs> operation side, it's about the numbers <coughs> side, because um, we seem to be off and I understand the reasons behind and market and otherwise, but uh, it seems to be coming a bit of a cash hole um, increasingly year on year, even though we're in principle budgeting for that decline. So when can we expect to see something back to Council um, in terms of the review and the, the numbers that come along with it? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, I, I, we have got that body of work in terms of the, the business case and the financial review of BD Park scheduled for this financial year. Um, we're just currently finalising the scoping up of that study, so we anticipate it to be finished by around about April next year um, at this stage. Certainly, uh, in the meantime, I'm happy to provide uh, councillors with um, a better understanding of the operational budget, which myself and the centre manager have been preparing, um, which gives a, a good insight to both the operating budget including um, all on costs as well as the operating budget excluding um, on costs such as corporate overheads and depreciation. So I'm certainly happy to distribute that to councillors so you do have a good understanding of how Betty Park is tracking at the moment. And just a further question, not, not to step outside of our role uh, as council, but given that it operates essentially on commercial terms whilst it's a community facility uh, and we, we agree to we agree in this chamber to budgets that are set that are provided by staff and management who have oversight over the facility and understand what what's going on within that space. Can we perhaps get some details about um, some of the KPIs and performance uh, expectations in terms of where where we are slipping from budget? What what measures are being taken to address that? Whether it be on one side of the ledger or the other, either cutting costs or in, improving revenue, because uh, it. it, it the story has been getting progressively worse over the last few years, and I think we'd, we'd, we need to have some more oversight over exactly what's going on. Through you, Mayor Cole, certainly happy to provide um, that level of information. Uh, what, what I think importantly we can also provide is the, the difference in the operating budget from last financial year compared to this financial year. One of the things we did do in recognition of the, the declining revenue was pull back several areas of expenditure, so that is one of the immediate measures we've taken, so I can certainly demonstrate that to Council, as well as a number of the KPIs that have been put in place for the next 12 months. To, to assist in addressing um, some of those matters as well. Any further questions on financial statements? Councillor Buckles. I just wanted to ask, because I know to the replacement page that's come through, um, through you, Mayor, this is simply that the numbers were in the wrong lines. Is that what? There's, there isn't actually a significant deterioration of any of those numbers since the initial one was published. It's just, it's just a wrong line issue. Through you, Mayor, Chair, uh, Mayor Cole, yes, um, there were some transposition errors that I picked up this evening. Apologise for those errors. Um, it won't happen again. <laughs> Any further questions on financial statements? Okay. Moving on to authorisation of expenditure for the period 1st to 28th of July 2017. I have a question in regards to, there's about $2,000 worth of SAS locksmith um, for this month. Is, can, are you able to explain, is this that we're losing, just losing a lot of keys or are these new premises? Uh, through the chair, we need to take that one on notice. Councillor Gondoshevsky, no? Any further questions on uh, authorisation or expenditure? No? Okay, we'll move on to item 7.3, which is a licence for use of land comprising a portion of a bike path on the Swan River under Wyndon Bridge, East Perth. Are there any questions in relation to this item? No, it seems very straightforward. Oh, we do have a question, Councillor Hallett. Somewhat related. Um, 
Okay. Do we have any other um, paths that are under this type of arrangement within the city? Uh, Director of Corporate Services, would you like to take that question? Uh, through the Chair, we will take it on notice. I'm delving through my mind and I can't think of any other instances where um, they would not be on you know, direct reserves um, under the care control and management of the city. This is an unusual situation in this particular case, but we'll take it on notice and if we can find something else, we'll uh, report on that. Anything further? Okay, we'll move on to the um, item 7.4, dedication of spite strip. I know, it's local government, it's always something new to discover. Um, dedication of Spite Strip pedestrian footpath as road, lot 15162 Robinson Avenue, Perth. Any questions in relation to this item? No questions? All right, we'll move on to item 7.5, investment report as at the 31st of July 2017. Councillor Loden. Thank you, Chair. Just to query, there has been discussions around an amendment to the um, investment policy um, to uh, remove some of the barriers we're having with further investment in uh, non-fossil fuel banks. Um, and I think that's proposed to come back to a workshop, potentially. Just wondering what the time frame was on that. Uh, through the Chair, it just so happens I have the Manager of Finance here, so you might be able to provide a response to that one. Yes, through the chair, um, I need to get some uh, more information out to the uh, workshop participants. Um, I'll be doing that in just over the next week and then um, call something probably in the next two weeks. So that would come to a, uh, that, that'll come to a council workshop or it'll come to a briefing or um, so I would uh, be intending to have further discussion with the, um, uh, the advisory panel that we convened earlier and then, and then bring it to a, uh, uh, a workshop. Any further questions? No? Okay, we'll move on to the item 7.6, which was a late item. Uh, Adoption of our long-term financial plan for the period 2017-18 to 2026-27. Any questions in relation to the long-term financial plan? Okay. No, Councillor Murphy does. Yeah, uh, just through the chair. I'm just wondering why, um, is there any reason why asset building and land sales um, wasn't considered in the long-term financial plan? Through the chair, um, essentially the long-term financial plan is working on current known or best known information. So at this point in time, we don't have plans for the sale, but it's certain for the sale of any land holdings. Um, but it is uh, a consideration that we're working on in uh, over the course of this financial year. So if and when that information becomes available, it can then be put into the long-term financial plan. So the long-term financial plan should be um, used and working on the basis of um, prudent and reasonably known um, data. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay, we'll move on to community engagement items. First up is uh, 8.1 petition for a multi-purpose court at Birdwood Square in Perth. Are there any questions in relation to this item? Okay, I have a question. I just wanted to, um, this might be something that you're aware or not aware of, um, Director for Community Engagement. I just wondered whether there was any plans for Highgate Primary School to reinstate a basketball court. And if, if there is, whether it would be publicly accessible uh, through Mayor Cole administration isn't aware, but um, I have um, heard that they are seeking to return a court as, as part of their future developments. So I'll certainly endeavour to clarify that either from the department or from the school um, and include it in the briefing notes. Um, would you like to take that question, Councillor? 
Yeah, um, so um, the Highgate Primary School um, Landscaping Master Plan that was prepared last year does um, have a multi-purpose court um, on the school site and it is my understanding that the school will be working towards reinstating a basketball court uh, at some point in the future, whether that will occur um, immediately following the um, opening of their new building or at some point in the future. Um, I guess from the perspective of whether it will be publicly accessible, Highgate Primary School for the most part has the low style of um, fencing and um, and so uh, the community has made use of the basketball court extensively over the years <coughs> on an informal basis. Um, so, And I don't envisage that that would change at all in the future. That's very good to know. It might be worth um, our community engagement Directorate just touching base with Highgate Primary School to see if there's any firmer information on, on dates, given that it's within is it, uh, 60 metres of Birdwood Square. <clears throat> OK, and just a, just a point that the Menzies netball ring is noted as a half court, but it's actually a semicircle, so I, I don't think it would... It's quite small. I don't think it would classify as a half court, so it might be worth checking. And just in terms of moving forward, it has been recognised that there's a gap in an area potentially to be filled by Highgate Primary School. Um, <clears throat> and just wanted to um, note that in terms of moving forward with the public open space strategy, um, in terms of responding to um, those residents who've asked for this particular uh, court, that we probably do need to acknowledge um, potentially more clearly in the recommend, uh, recommended motion that there has been an identified shortfall in the area subject to advice from uh, Highgate Primary School. That's a, a suggestion. Um, just, in, just when I read the motion, it just seemed to be potentially reading as an outright no, whereas I think that the, when you go through and read the body of the report, it talked more about the fact that there is um, more of this type of facility um, further um, north um, than Highgate. Yes, through you, Mayor Cole, we'll, we'll look and, uh, at the recommendations and also uh, exactly what communications we have with the lead petitioner moving forward, but certainly the desktop analysis confirms that there is a gap within the central part of the city, um, so that should certainly be brought to the petitioner's attention. May I ask a question which is, uh, while not on the netball courts, is related to activating some of these spaces um, generally, and that's in regards to whether there are any plans to install more exercise equipment in some of these key parks. They're very, very well utilised from the parks that I've seen them be used in, so perhaps we can take that on notice for a discussion at a further point, but there's obviously increased pressure. Um, yeah, so just a general discussion about more activation through things that are maybe not courts, which take up a lot of space. Through you, Mayor Cole, that, that is certainly one of the key outcomes from the public open space strategy, is understanding, based on the hierarchy of, of our public open space, what level of infrastructure should be place within the park um, and then also looking at what is provided within particular neighbourhood catchments so that we provide access to a variety of amenities but don't oversupply those amenities in some areas and undersupply in others. So it's certainly a, a very relevant point and one that I hope the, the public open strategy um, provides council with some guidance with moving forward. Thank you, Director. Any further questions? Okay, we'll move on to... Um Item 8.2, adoption of policy number 3.10.7, art collection and policy number 3.10.11, public art. Any questions in relation to this item? Okay, we'll move on to unrecoverable parking infringements, 1st of January 2011 to 30th of June 2017. Councillor Murphy. Um, yeah, through the chair, uh, just in regards to... Um, the comments section of the report uh, mentioned that a detailed reconciliation process and improved administration, as administrative practices are put into place to ensure this doesn't occur again. I'm just interested um, in wondering if there's anything else Council could do, uh, such as 
well, just throwing it out there, but do you, do you think there would be any evidence to suggest that a reduction in the in the amount of fines would encourage people, or do you think that the high amount of fines dissuades people from paying their parking fines, or do you think that that is uh, of no consequence? Do you understand? Uh, through you, um, Mayor Cole, the, the, the primary issue with these infringements that have been referred through to FER is that they have um, they have been issued, a final demand notice has been issued, um, and then after a period of 35 days they are referred to FER. So these are infringements that for all intents and purposes um, it would be assumed that the recipient of that infringement has no intention to pay. Um, that isn't always the case. We do receive payments through FER and we do all also receive very, very late payments and indeed some of, some of those included in this reconciliation process have only been paid in the last few weeks and months. So, but for the most part, when infringements are referred through to FER, an extended period has passed uh, and therefore it is assumed that the recipient has no intention of paying, which is where the FER is very useful because they have, uh, I guess, the added ability to um, take someone's licence away from them, which is something that the city doesn't have. I guess I'm wondering, is there anything that... So you're basically saying that there's nothing else Council could do to um, encourage payment of fines? <laughs> uh, no, not in, not in my view. Um, look, I have a question in relation to the overall um, outstanding receivables amount in the financial report, which still shows $2.136 million um, dollars worth of infringement over 90 days, and that this is about 1% of that global sum. Um, so I'm just wondering, um, given that there is still uh, a considerable amount of outstanding um, fines that this seems quite a small proportion to actually write off and in terms of reconciling um, our financial management system with the FER it does seem like a, a very small drop in the ocean and, and, and how is administration going with tackling that outstanding amount that we um, still see appearing on financial statements. Uh, through the Chair, um, certainly we have over the last couple of years been undertaking a reconciliation and so um, last year we undertook what was certainly the first reconciliation for many years um, and that saw a more sizeable uh, write-off, certainly of debts going back quite a few years. Um, the, the more recent reconciliation has now been bringing that um, much more up to date and we actually have balanced to the FER information. Essentially you now have a situation where um, so that the, the outstanding debt is not only the parking infringement, it's also the costs that have been um, loaded on by FER. And um, that will sit there essentially and, and run through the FER process and they are continuously reviewing their, um, their opportunities for recovery and so we, we follow their advice. So until such time as they say there is no opportunity of recovery of that debt, um, it will stay on the books and FER will pursue it through their various courses. So um, I, I'd suggest that it, it's something that we have to um, wear and, and again we, most of that debt is now, um, as you can see from this report, relatively recent years debt. So it's no longer going back to you know, 2006, sevens and eights, etc. This is now coming right up to date and I think these debts are from, the, the write-offs are from 2010 and 11. So um, it's not unusual to have a reasonable amount outstanding because that's the process that FER go through to recover the costs and they will certainly be continuously writing to us, um, recommending uh, or advising us essentially those that they now believe are not recoverable and therefore would need to be written off. Thank you. So this is a sort of report that we should expect to see regularly coming to Council as we work through that with the FER. Okay, thank you. My question relates to um, those 
people on here who are up to 15, in some cases, tickets being um, written off. Five, four, three, fifteen. 15, I haven't gone through it um, line by line, but those are the ones that stand out. So in our, I've got two questions in regards to the payment options and whether we perhaps even could see a copy of the type of communication where we're trying to encourage people even to pay down their debt in small amounts, whether our system allows that or whether there's a cost involved in that as well, and whether we <clears throat> reserve the right or communicate to debtors that we may make a lodgement um, against their credit and financial history or whether there's a cost to us to do that as well. So I'm just interested in all of that, the levers that we may have to encourage carrot and stick approach people to pay down their debts, even if it's small amounts or even if it's not the full amounts, but um, we get close to it. Uh, through the chair, a couple of points there. One is I think we should um, have a look at those write-offs where there are multiples to identify if there is an issue there in terms of um, more, more recent um, infringements that may be um, issued, etc., or to try and identify whether that vehicle is still around, etc. FER have indicated that it's unrecoverable, so they either can't find the person or perhaps they've spent a little bit of time in jail to acquit the debt or uh, whatever it else it is. Um, but once we transfer the debt to FER, it's FER's system that, of recovery and we, we, we're not involved in that anymore. Um, and so our opportunity to um, encourage payments is you know, up to that 90 day period. Once it goes to FER, it's on FER books and they are totally in, um, manage that process and enter into payment arrangements or whatever processes that they need to go through. Any further questions? Okay, we'll move on to um, item 8.4. Proposed Parking and Parking Facilities Amendment Local Law 2017. Councillor Tobelberg and then Councillor Kontoshevsky. Thank you. Just because this is one of our few chances to get down to the nitty gritty of these sorts of things, i um, happy for it to be taken on notice. Or not. Uh, can you explain to me, please, this is to the Director of uh, Community Engagement, the difference between stopping contrary to a no stopping or clear way sign and stopping during the times when a sign specifies a no stopping or clearway restriction is in operation. Specifically, how would you possibly stop contrary to the sign unless you were parking in there when it says you can't park there? That is a very good question, Councillor Topperberg, that I will take on notice. Because one, one finds double what the other one is, so I'd just like to know if there is mm. a difference. Um, I think that was... Yeah, that was my only... My only question, because yeah, and I think that we've actually had issue before with the ticket being issued for one and not the other, and it hasn't been clear. So if we can get some clarity around that, that would be great. Thank you. Um, I have a question in regards to stopping. Sorry, Sorry. Councillor Gondoshevsky is next, and then you can go. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Um, my question relates to um, point eight point eight uh, vehicles not to obstruct a public place or thoroughfare. Oh God, thoroughfare. Um, so it says point uh, subsection two says that a vehicle which is parked in any portion of a public place where vehicles may be lawfully parked is deemed to cause an obstruction and may be impounded where the vehicle is parked for any period exceeding 24 hours uh, without the permission of local government. So my reading of that says that if you park where you're allowed to park for more than 24 hours, you need to ask us in order to do so. Um, I, I, I would presume in practice that the uh, potentially a, a residence parking per permit could qualify as asking, but in streets where we don't have parking restrictions, how does a resident ask us to park for more than 24 hours in a place they're legally allowed to park? Through you, Mayor Cole, this was uh, a clause that's been amended based on some uh, challenges Rangers have had in the last couple of years. Uh, the, the way the clause was previously worded and inserted, it was there for the intention of enabling Rangers to enforce and ultimately remove abandoned vehicles um, parked on our streets. 
unfortunately what's been occurring and, and coincidentally um, it's been in uh, Galway Street as an example is where uh, a resident has um, within their rights parked on the street in front of their house um, but the example I'll use is, is a FIFO worker where they're away for days at a time um, so strictly speaking their vehicle is parked in a public space space, that being an on-street um, bay for more than 24 hours. That was not the intention for that clause to be utilised, whereby we've got adjacent residents asking the city to have a vehicle of a, of a neighbour removed because it hasn't moved for, for 24 hours. So the reason why this wording has been changed is so that it does um, allow the rangers to remove a vehicle if it's been abandoned, or indeed if a vehicle um, is in a particular location for an extended period of time and is causing a hazard, then the rangers can have it removed. But at the same time, it provides the rangers that level of flexibility so that if it is clearly a resident's vehicle and they're just away from home for five days, we can give approval so that there, there is no need to enforce that particular clause. I guess um, I'm just wondering, in relation to the practicality of a 24-hour trigger where we may have residents that um, catch public transport to work and park on the street, and I, I guess um, I, I think it's important that we um, make sure that when we intervene that it's a realistic intervention that we, as much as we have discretion um, around enforcement, that we don't set up a situation where um, we would be penalising people for undertaking a practice that generally we wouldn't have a problem with. Um, so I guess my question is... I was just going to say... Thank you. I'm uh, getting you there. Don't worry. You can easily turn that into a question. I'm going to... My, my question is... Um, in relation to these sorts of local laws, is the 24-hour trigger used in other jurisdictions or has, is there consideration of longer periods of time that may be used in similar laws elsewhere? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, I'll take uh, the comparison with other jurisdictions on notice, but certainly uh, the administration's approach to this clause and the amendment has been to ensure that uh, it is used effectively. Uh, Rangers only... Um, enforce this clause currently where a vehicle has been abandoned. Um, that the reason for amending the wording of the clause is to ensure that um, that remains the only time it's used. So certainly from an, an enforcement perspective, uh, we, we will not be, and in fact we are endeavouring to avoid um, penalising or enforcing people who are within their rights parking on a public street, whether that be at the front of their house or for the purposes of, of catching public transport. So um, I can certainly appease your concerns in the sense that the amendment has been made to, to try to avoid those situations, but we'll do some, some comparison with other jurisdictions just to see whether um, we should look at a, at a greater period than 24 hours. Um, I have a question which I'm going to um, I'll send it to you on notice because it relates to a question I sent through last year not on behalf of an individual but in regards to car place and some ambiguity in the signage and what fine would apply um, you won't remember it, I'm sure because it wasn't that exciting but I'll as part of this I'll send that email through again but I've got a couple of questions in regards to potential ambiguity in the penalties and one of them is 4644, moving, moving a vehicle to avoid time limitation. If you could... Do you want me to read out the ones that are just... Because um, I don't need an answer tonight, just to... Um, the other one is in regards to stopping near an obstruction, near fire hydrant and near bus stop, whether there's anything more specific on the fine as to what constitutes near. Um, and the other one is in regards to stopping unlawfully in a taxi zone or bus zone. How does that relate to Uber drivers and the current discussion we're having at the moment about potential shared spaces with taxis and Ubers or other types of pickup services? You can answer next week, it's fine. Now, Cole, I will take um, a couple of those on notice, but certainly my understanding and the Director of Technical Services may add to this, but um, a bus sign is for buses and a taxi zone is for taxis. It doesn't contemplate um, Ubers or other ride-sharing um, vehicles. 
Sorry, I've got two others, um, and it is removing a notice on a vehicle, what that relates to, and all other offences not specified. The catch-all, perhaps some clarification on what that means and how far and wide that could be applied, because it's a ninety-five dollar fine. Yes, I'll take those on notice and provide a response in the briefing notes. Can I just follow up on sort of a, relevant to Councillor Harley's question in relation to um, taxi zones and one of the new offences being proposed as leaving a taxi unattended in a taxi zone or rank, which is welcome. Um, but we have been having the conversation about more generic um, pick up and set down areas and moving away from specific ta taxi ranks. And this could also have um, an impact on Kiss and Ride, which is a matter I will come and discuss with you where I've had a request for the 5P to be removed and just have a pick up and set down area. Um, so I'm just wondering whether we actually need to include um, um, or look at the possibility of having a further, um, including within the, um, the uh, local law, a more generic pick up and set down area and then looking at whether we need a new offence for leaving a car unattended in a pick up and set down area. Uh, thank you, Mayor Cole. We'll certainly uh, take that on notice and, and review whether that's required. The, the specific amendment that has been included in, in regards to taxi, taxi ranks is in direct response to the issues we're experiencing in Leadable Town Centre, uh, whereby a major cause of that congestion is taxis parking in the taxi um, rank, um, but then taking time to stretch their legs and go and grab a kebab. And as a result, the, uh, the queuing of taxis is coming up Newcastle Street and around. And Oxford, possibly other um, other food options as well. So um, that we're currently uh, trying to uh, approach that um, in a number of different ways. And um, in, indeed, we met today in terms of uh, the temporary uh, relocation of the taxi rank and, and consultation with local businesses. But that. That clause um, is one that has worked effectively in the city of Perth, and so we saw that as another tool that we can use from an enforcement perspective to uh, deal with some of these town centre um, taxi issues. Can I just ask two further questions in relation to that? One, uh, does the responsibility, so if that offence is issued, it lies, I presume, with the owner of the taxi plates because it applies to the vehicle, so if the infringement is issued, any enforcement or follow-up, irrespective of who the driver is, would be with the owner of the taxi uh, plates, is one. And the other is uh, whether the proposed fine for that offence is something that we can uh, tinker with between now and next Tuesday, if we so desire. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, in response to the first question, yes, that's correct. It's the, uh, the, the registered owner of the vehicle, and indeed, uh, over the last few Friday and Saturday nights when rangers have been on site, um, because of the fact that they're having to um, issue multiple infringements and are also facing um, some um, abuse from the taxi drivers, uh, they have actually been uh, prosecuting and issuing infringements via photograph, um, which reaffirms that it's actually the, the registered vehicle owner who will receive the infringement. In terms of uh, your second question, we have, as part of this local law review, um, done some comparison with other modified penalties in, in other local government areas, but certainly happy to do that again specifically for this offence to see whether um, to provide council with the options as to whether you wish to uh, tinker with the amount in this local law. Um, I also just wanted to ask a very minor question in relation to leaving a car unattended in a um, also parking around a cul-de-sac and I just wondered whether community are aware of the fact that you can't park in a cul-de-sac and whether this is going to have to cause yellow no stopping lines to be marked around all cul-de-sacs. Through you, Mayor Collar, we'll just take that on notice in the sense, um, and I'll, I'll liaise further with the Director of Technical Services as to whether um, ultimately how many cul-de-sacs we've got and, and ultimately how, how much extra line marking and signage would be required in, in, in terms of enforcing that local law. So I'll, um, or that clause, I should say, so I'll get that clarity and inc include that in the briefing notes. I just thought one that comes to mind is Kingston Avenue in West Perth where it's not the smallest of cul-de-sacs so a car 
could think that they can still park at the end without impacting on the a turning circle. Yeah. Any further questions on the local law? Councillor Hallett? Somewhat tangential again, apologies. Um, just wondering maybe to the Acting Director of Technical Services, um, what's the frequency, I guess, for us for repainting some of those um, those yellow lines? Because there's quite a few that have been quite faded um, already and I'm not quite sure how frequently they are. Uh, through the Chair, obviously, we do the town centres more frequently and we do that on assessment. Um, with the, the lower order streets, sometimes we let them go a bit longer because the, become, the problem resolves itself. People become accustomed that they can't park there and we don't find it necessary then to refresh them on a regular basis. But obviously if the issue arises again then we, we go back and redo it. But certainly our focus is on the town centre and activity centres. And local primary schools. <laughs> yeah. Okay, any further questions? No, we'll move on to... Um Chief Executive Officer's item, which is the information bulletin. Are there any questions in relation to this item? Councillor Loden. Um, just on item nine around the uh, development services statistics, um, it shows a, uh, a reduction in three in terms of the number of uh, development applications we have on place. But I imagine we've also got some new applications in that time interval, so I was wondering if if you knew how many new applications there were in the month and if there's a way that could be reflected just to show that it wasn't that we only processed three development applications in the last month? Yes, um, through the Mayor, um, it might not be clear. Hopefully it will become clearer over time. Um, but the numbers reflect the end of the month, so sorry, the start of the month. Um, so the number of DAs lodged in July was 38 and the number determined was 34 and there were seven withdrawn. Um, so we will include that, that information as we go along. Councillor Hallett. Uh, apologies if I've missed it. Just wondering if um, we could have a, a report on the stats from the live streaming um, on a monthly basis. I think that was somewhere, but it's not in the information um, bulletin wondering if that might be a good spot for it. Um, might hand you over to our manager of governance because I think there was an email on that matter but perhaps you could provide some advice. Uh, yes but we can certainly provide that in future in the information bulletin but there was an email that went round I haven't got the figures to hand but it was a it was approximately 50 to 60 uh, viewers on average per per meeting after I think the first three or four rounds of uh, briefing and meeting cycles. From memory, I think the first one was 118 unique views, and then it was sitting around 60, which is still pretty good. That's um, because I counted the seats in the public gallery, and there's 80 seats, so that's um, three quarters of a public gallery. And there could be two people looking at the one screen, or they could be having a party and inviting some friends around. So, thank you for everyone out there who's tuning in. Um, I did have some questions just in relation to the register of SAT appeals. Um, it's great to see that we're now marking representation. Thank you for doing that. And I just did have a question. I didn't see 238 to 246 Oxford Street um, on the list. And um, please, please take it on notice. I'm just really wanting to get a bit of an update on when, where that's at and when it's likely to be re-advertised to the community. Um, through the Mayor, it's currently being re-advertised at the moment. Um, it's not on the list because it's a JDAP application, and so it should sit in the JDAP, if, that's, if I've got the right application. Um, well, it was appealed to the... Um, I thought it was in mediation um, with the SAT, and I think I looked at the JDAP list too, and I don't think I saw it there either. It's a bit tricky to find because it's not bookmarked, the actual attachments. Oh, actually, I think you can go back to the beginning. Let me just have a look.
Uh, yes, through the mayor. I've I found it's on page three seven three is the DAP the DAP applications, and you're correct. It's not in that list. It should be in that list, and we'll have that updated before next week. Um, it is back before the JDAP now, as is Rosewood, which is on the list. So they're both in, at exactly the same point in the process. The SAT has requested the JDAP reconsider a revised proposal, and both are being advertised at the same time, and advertising closes at the same time, though um, the Rosewood will be considered by the JDAP first and then Oxford Street subsequently. Um, has advertising commenced? Yes. And when will it conclude? I don't have the date, but it's in approximately two weeks. Thank you. Any further questions on the information bulletin? Okay. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Yes, sorry. Yes. Um, on attachment six, and it's to do with the withdrawals, so um, we've consistently had the highest number of withdrawals, and so in this case it's $83,000. Although I acknowledge it's gone down significantly um, from previous years, where it was closer to about two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year of our own write-offs or withdrawals, so the consistently high number is still ranger and, and administrative adjustment. So can I ask whether there's ongoing work to identify that from a um, QA perspective and a improvement perspective? And sorry, my second question to that is how, for next week, how does that compare to the previous six months and then the same time last year? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, I will uh, provide those comparisons in the briefing notes. Um, yes, there are there are three key reasons um, that contribute to those ranger or ad administrative um, adjustments. Uh, first of all, uh, the auto site machines that the rangers use are um, cumbersome and old and increasingly failing. Uh, one of the constant issues we've had over the last few months in particular is that those machines keep resetting their date um, whilst the rangers are on shift. So the rangers correct the date at the start of their shift, but if they don't keep an eye on it um, and it reverts to a, a particular date, I can't remember what it is, but um, straight away once that doesn't align with the date that the infringement occurs, uh, then that is deemed to be invalid and therefore it's withdrawn. So uh, importantly, we have just um, finalised uh, an RFQ to replace those machines. And so within the next um, few weeks, the, the rangers will have far better machines. It'll be far more reliable and, and much easier to, to hold. Um, so that is one major reason. The second reason is a lot of those adjustments um, are issued by casual uh, rangers uh, who are employed, for example, when there are major events at NIB. Uh, that's been a, an ongoing challenge um, since I've arrived at the city. Uh, we have put in place some improved training practices and improved supervision of their um, tasks. However, that does still continue to be an issue, so we certainly have have our eye on that. Um, and the third is, is a common um, scenario where a ranger makes an error. Um, and indeed they identify that before they're finished issuing the infringement. Uh, so they simply void that from the machine. A void actually counts as an administrative adjustment as well. So on a large number of occasions that is simply corrected and an infringement with the correct details is then issued. So um, certainly aware that that is a, a common area where a number of withdrawals are, are taking place and we'll continue to monitor and improve that as we can. Thank you. So a question from that answer then is with the m new machines, will these have the capacity to photograph the ticket in situ on the dashboard, which is the most common get out of jail free card, literally? Yes, through you, Mayor Cole. Um, ultimately, they're, they're smartphones, so they certainly have that capability. And from a director's perspective and, and being the person that a lot of these requests for withdrawals come past my desk, uh, one of the difficult things is the um, either the lack of photographs or the, the poor photographs that make it very difficult to uphold certain infringements. So not only will these new devices have the ability to take photographs, but we've in place, put in place some standard operating procedures as well to make sure that rangers are actually taking photographs of the whole windscreen. 
um, of the whole vehicle and of the signage next to the vehicle so that we have confidence when a request for withdrawal is received that we can um, decline that if indeed we're confident that the infringement did take place. So my next question is in regards to the category G, which has again been an ongoing issue, a resident or visitor permit issue, but not displayed. Are we able to again have same time last year and comparison with the previous six months just to have a look at the trends? Um, it's still about 500 people a year who are getting fined for not having a valid permit displayed. Um, and the third question relates to category two, which is you know, significantly less, but is still a high amount in comparison with the other categories, financial hardship, disability, police on duty. Um, some time ago, we asked for a breakdown of what they were um, so that we understood, is, do we have a whole lot of police out there, you know, parking, you know, over the city illegally? Is it, you know, so, so what the categories are for monitoring? Um, and whether the police know that stopping to get a coffee may not count as police on duty, and stopping in a stopping zone, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which is, presents a very bad, a poor picture of illegal parking um, outside cafes in no stopping and loading zones, etc. So, just perhaps, I'll flag a question next week about communication with police. I threw you in there, Cole. What, what I will do is provide um, comparative data across all of those, those categories. I may not be able to provide the, the detailed data for um, a specific category by issue, but I'll certainly endeavour to by next week, and if not, um, provide that to councillors at a later date. Any further questions in relation to the information bulletin? Okay, we'll move on to notices of motion. First notice of motion is 10.1 from Councillor Jonathan Hallett to investigate reduction or elimination of single-use plastics. Are there any questions in relation to this item? Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you. Um, so I think my question is uh, would have been directed to the CEO were, were he here. So it's probably, um, I guess, uh, I obviously understand uh, and appreciate the intent, but I guess just wanted to get some clarity. There's been obviously some change in strategic direction or some strategic uh, direction provided in terms of some of the council decision making, and I guess we could attach a million of these requests as to to find different ways to achieve what we're trying to achieve in terms of our waste out, uh, of our waste minimisation strategy and our, our overall waste strategy. Um, is it? I get the question, I suppose, and it perhaps is to um, uh, Mr. Quirk, who's sitting in the CEO's chair currently, or, uh, or to um, perhaps uh, it may be through to the acting director of tech services. Is this the sort of feedback, or this is sort of uh, recommendations that we should be expecting to see as a result of the waste strategy going forward, and actually setting the strategic direction at council and these specific initiatives uh, then being uh, being coming forth from uh, administration rather than being driven from the chamber, because as, as I say, I understand the, the, the genesis of it, but uh, just trying to get an, I, an idea of where we sit between strategic uh, direction and actually uh, on the ground uh, practical solutions and what the administration, uh, rather than it just being a matter of whatever comes from the chamber, will, will be enacted. If that makes sense. It's kind of a roundabout question. Um, through the Mayor. Um, it certainly would be ideal for, as, as part of discussions around the sustainable environment strategy, which um, is being reviewed this financial year, for these kinds of um, strategies to be proposed and for that detail to be then addressed and embedded through the sustainable environment strategy. Um, however, councillors uh, have the right to put up notices of motion and um, in this case, um, the initiative is not something that we have previously investigated um, and does, ha does have merit and will be um, considered as part of the Sustainable Environment Strategy Review, which is being undertaken this year and will be presented to Council. So um, either way, it will be considered, um, but it is an initiative that, where that the administration is happy to put together information on um, for Council to then consider as part of the Sustainable Environment Strategy, part of the, the new budget, part of the new corporate business plan. So 
we're not proposing to actually um, but the request is not to implement those changes this financial year, it's to investigate them. Um, council members are, are welcome to request uh, that information through a notice of motion or through an email or a, or a meeting or discussion with administration. Thank you. Through you, Chair, um, through you and to you, Director, I think in 2012 there was a motion about plastic bags for I believe 2012, it was under Mayor Alana McTiernan. Um, perhaps could I ask that that be um, distributed to existing councillors so they can see what our previous decision was um, and provide an update on the steps we took then uh, to engage with state government about the banning of plastic bags across the city, Vincent? Um, perhaps I could answer that one. When I um, put up the notice of motion about plastic bags, it was referred to and I'm not sure that it was included. The the reason for the motion coming forward did talk about that in some detail. I'm not sure it was um, attached as a, a an attachment but it referred to the, de the decision of council and it referred to the date at which it was made and what action and why that could not be followed through at the time. So that did form the information part of that, that motion at the time. But one thing that this does raise for me is um, use of dog dog do bags because you know that really does already tie into the plastic bag use so as part of um, this motion I'd really like to get some information on how we've attempted to deal with that in the past in terms of those yellow plastic bags that we have at, that the city purchases and supplies at all um, reserves where dogs are not all not just off leash but at many of our reserves and what attempts have been made to deal with that in the past and whether there are any alternatives that exist and that could be trialled. Would you count them as single-use bags, Mayor, then? I certainly would. I wouldn't <laughs> like to reuse one. Uh, through you, Mayor, um, just to clarify, this notice of... Uh, this notice of motion relates to reduction of single-use plastics overall, so it's not just about plastic bags. Um, in order to provide that information around um, the, the dog waste bags, um, we would need to, to do the audit that is um, recommended as part of this notice of motion. So we won't be able to provide all the detail. We can certainly have a look at some of the background before next week, but um, we certainly won't be able to provide all of the detail that will come out of this um, if it is adopted by Council. I think in response to that, I'll pursue that question separately with the Director, Acting Director of Tech Services, given that it ties in with the motion that was adopted by Council on single-use plastic bags. Are there any other questions in relation to the notice of motion? No? OK, move on to... Oh, sorry, Jonathan, you've got a question not on your own motion. Um, just wondering if the Director of um, Development Services could elaborate a little bit on, I guess, some of the existing review processes in the um, in Vincent that this is able to pay piggyback onto, um, and then also any um, potential quick wins that have already been identified. Um, yes, th through the Mayor, as I mentioned earlier, um, this will certainly be part of the Sustainable Environment Strategy Review um, and the budget. Um, for next year, which we're already starting to put a list together of um, the background research work that needs to be done for, which is um, a positive sign. We're starting that very early, um, and similarly with the corporate business plan. Um, in relation to quick wins, um, just the initial review of um, the, the issues surrounding this request, it's been identified that there are some very easy wins that we can achieve um, just in the office here with the use of um, plastic cups um, and they can easily be replaced with alternatives that are the same price and they don't cost any more. So there's, there's lots of um, quick wins in that space that we've identified already um, and we can implement those um, without even um, needing to present all of that back to council because there is no cost implication. So. And just to add to that, there was quite an attempt to make the Imagine Vincent workshop as plastic free as possible, and there was use of um, glasses instead of plastics, etc. So there's been a conscious effort by the city to start to engage in some of these practices already. Councillor Tobelberg? So, just further to that, so I guess my question about the gap between strategic intent being set by 
independent decisions or otherwise from the chamber and then things like for instance that whilst we have a apparently a cost efficient alternative that is uh, environmentally uh, or more environment, environmentally sustainable yet we're not making that choice I'd like to see whilst this is maybe the, the driver for it some more information and discussion perhaps at workshop level about what at what point are we setting strategy and intent and if we're trying to bring around cultural change in some of these elements what is needed from the chamber and what then becomes just the general course of business within the city because uh, some of those things to me are incongruous that we that we would have those options available to us uh, but not be pursuing them because the strategic uh, the strategic direction has been to my mind largely set by council and community in terms of some of the decision making and some of the goings on in the last you know 24 36 months in, in and around that space in particular um yeah so that, that i suppose highlights for me what that question was around is what what do administration want from council and can we over the next six to 12 months perhaps get some uh some some more clarity around what you're looking for from council in terms of uh, that which i'm sure will be borne out in the scp and other Yes, um, through the Mayor, as I said, the sustainable environment strategy is the key um, strategy that will set that strategic direction. Currently, um, it doesn't cover these specific issues and a number of the issues that have been discussed over the last um, 36 months or, or the few months that I certainly um, can recall that they've been raised. Um, so the key is, is updating that strategy and that will reset the um, the direction to align with um, the notices of motion that have been raised by council recently. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay, we'll move on to 10.2. This is a notice of motion from Councillor Gontoshevsky in relation to strategies to improve participation and accessibility by women and girls probably needed to add to sporting um, facilities. Are there any questions? No. Okay, we'll move on to um, a late item, um, notice of motion 10.3 that I have put forward on behalf of council if you'd like, to, like it to be on behalf of council um, in relation to re um, reaffirmation of support for marriage equality. Are there any questions on this item? I guess um, I really support this, support the item strongly. And I was just, um, I guess, not, it's not really a question, but just wanting to flag that I would be interested in seeing whether there was um, any other budget that we could cobble together to, you know, maybe put some more substantial things other than just flag flying in the, in the lead up to the referendum. I just think that it's, um, or the plebiscite, sorry, is that um, I, th I think it is a, actually a really important issue. And I think that given that we're in this situation where there's a, where there's a postal plebiscite going at, likely going ahead, then I'm, I think the city is in a position to take a bit of a lead role and you know try and generate some some media coverage and support. Just to, I, I'd like to think that if people come to Vincent, they will be greeted with visible signs other than just flags that you know you know they come to Leadville, come to Mount Lawley, and are just reminded that a yes vote would be really. Would be really, I think, so good, good for society. In relation yeah. to your question, yeah, is so it the, about so the what question is, uh, if more, a budget just, allocation could be made? Well, I guess I was just noting that I was looking at, I'll, I'll be looking at options to add something to this, if possible, in terms of further budget. I guess the answer will be no. There's no, there's no further budget unless council determines to reallocate it from something else. <laughs> Um, this might be a good question for the Director of Community Engagement. It seems to fit well within your area. Is there potential for budget? It's difficult to know. I mean, some things could be free. Um, doesn't necessarily have a budget attached to it, but how would we go about attaching budget to this item? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole. What, look, what we certainly can do over the next couple of days is just have a look at... Um, what that might mean in terms of initiatives. As you mentioned, some of that might be low cost or no cost. Um, and also within our marketing and communications area, we do have um, budget for varying corporate initiatives. So um, without giving a, a firm commitment, I can certainly, um, there are a couple of areas that we can look um, and, and provide some, some options for council to consider um, with an associated budget impact if there is one. 
I'd already flagged that potentially we could have a flag raising ceremony and invite the local media, which would be a probably an uncated free event. <laughs> Any further questions on this item? Okay. Um, at this point, we will have to have a mover and seconder to move behind closed doors because we do have one con one confidential item to consider um, this evening, and at this time, we will cease to stream um, the, the meeting, um, but at the end of the confidential session we'll come back to the live stream and I'll read out the decision of council. Oh, sorry. My sincere apologies. I just went into council mode. There is no decision tonight. So at this point, um, given that we're moving into confidential item and there is no decision to report back on, this will be the end of the live stream for the evening. Apologies for the confusion. Do I have a mover and seconder to move in camera? Moved, Councillor Gontoszewski. We don't need one, sorry.